Okay, so I hope you can hear me at the back. Uh, good. So I'm very, very pleased to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Yuri and the other members of the whomever for inviting me here. And as he said, I'd like to tell you something about technologies using spin and currents of ions that we might use to create new types of uh, technologies for computing. I thought I mentioned briefly that I moved to Germany just three years ago, and this is the Max Planck Institute where I'm currently the, uh, one of the directors, which is in Halle, a small town about a, uh, an hour from Berlin. And it's very close to the Martin Luther University, which is one of the oldest universities in, in Germany. And of course, I wanted to mention that uh, one of the reasons why I went to Germany was uh, because I got married to a German scientist, Fadi Feltzer. <laughs> and she's, uh, she's, she uh, is a fantastic scientist in her own right. Now, uh, this institute was built 25 years ago uh, with the re reunification of Germany. And I've been very busy in the last three and a half years since I went there, modernizing it. So I wanted to briefly mention that we had to modernize the whole building and we created a lot of new capabilities. So my expertise is in building new materials by a variety of thin film deposition techniques. And the goal is to build these materials essentially by depositing one atomic layer of one material, one atomic layer of another, and so on and so forth, using a variety of techniques. Some of these are shown here. I'm not going to discuss them, except on the top right, you can see a very special system that we spent the last three years building in my institute. We call it Mango. And the idea is this system will enable us to accelerate the discovery of new materials by being more quickly able to change the source materials. So this system has about 45 different source materials in which we could use to create these atomically engineered structures. This is by a technique called sputtering, where you use a plasma of, for example, argon to impinge on a block of material, and this will knock out atoms, and we can collect them on a wafer, which can be held at temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees centigrade to create these structures. And on the bottom left, you can see a commercial system, same technique on the bottom right, you can see a commercial system using very uh, powerful lasers to ablate material from targets for the same purpose. We also have a lot of characterization capabilities that we built in the last few years, and in particular, on the bottom right, you can see an aberration corrected transmission electron microscope, which we've adopted to enable us to look at magnetic uh, structures, which I want to briefly discuss in my talk. We've also built a completely new clean room with a wide variety of capabilities for making structures down to, let's say, 10 nanometers in size using electron beam lithography and optical lithography. And, of course, uh, most importantly, uh, we can't do all this research without uh, uh, PhD students and uh, postdocs, and I've hired quite a lot in the last three years from all over the world. But I'm talking to now, turning to the topic of my talk, I really want to bring you back to computing. And if you look, this is a very famous chart from Ray Kurzweil, and it basically is basically the number of computing operations per second that you can buy with $1,000. And in the last century, we've evolved using different technologies from mechanical technologies till today's integrated circuit technologies. Uh, over a period of a century, we've improved the performance of computing systems by many orders of magnitude. And of course, you are all living in an era that's lasted the longest, integrated circuits using silicon CMOS technologies. But most scientists believe, most technologists believe, we're coming to the end of this era and we need to do something else. And this era has basically used technologies that were invented 40 years ago and has involved shrinking these to tinier and tinier dimensions. And the dimensions today are so tiny that they no longer operate in a world and manner that enables these technologies to con continue. And mostly it's because they require too much energy to carry out this further scaling. So we need to do something else, and today I've learned uh, a lot about the very interesting programs here, for example, in quantum computing, and this has become a topic of major interest around the world in just the last few years, where we use different concepts to build computing systems using quantum mechanical phenomena. I'm not going to discuss this, but it's very, very interesting, although it's not something we're working on. And something else I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in is what we might call cognitive computing, and this concept is we want to borrow ideas from biology about how we ourselves think and how our brain operates to potentially use some of those uh, intrinsic concepts to build new devices and systems of devices in particular that could think as energy efficiently as our own brains. I may come back to that at the end of my talk if I have time. <laughs> 
But what we want to do is go beyond today's devices for computing, which are essentially uses the electron currents, or the storing numbers of electrons in capacitors for memories, controlling currents of electrons in transistors for computing elements. We want to go beyond the charge because of its limitations, in particular of power, and maybe we could use currents of spin, spin of the electrons, and these currents of spin can carry no charge, and therefore can be very, in principle, energy, uh, low energy, has a low energy possibility. And something I'm particularly interested in is using currents of ions. And we've shown that we could use ionic currents to modify materials, to change their phase from metals to insulators. And in this way, we can build very interesting potential non-volatile devices. And again, I'd like to talk about that towards the end of my talk. So this is computing and computing. But uh, in terms of storing information, perhaps one of the most important technological breakthroughs uh, was 500 years ago. And it turns out it was in Germany, in the city of Mainz, by this guy, Johannes Gutenberg. And he invented something called a movable type press. So before that, you had to write information with a pen on paper. So it was very difficult to spread information. So it was basically information was within the hands of a few people. Now, his movable type press meant that he could print books. Here is a Bible. And he could print many copies of the same book more efficiently. And eventually, this led, in some sense, to the age of the Enlightenment because of the spread of knowledge. Now, this technology era of analog, storing information in an analog form, you could argue, has lasted more than 500 years. And about 50 years ago, or maybe a little bit longer, IBM invented a technology which is a magnetic disk drive technology. And that's a digital technology where you store information. As you can see here, this is a magnetic film a very thin magnetic film. It's on a glass platter, as shown here. The platter is rotated mechanically, and we have a device that you can see which is used for reading and writing information. This device here is shown here. This is a, a head, and this reading writing head today in operation is approximately one nanometer from the surface of this magnetic layer. So it's a tremendous technology. Just like computing technology, it has evolved by shrinking the size of a magnetic region, which we're inspecting here using magnetic force microscopy, to shrink it, and it shrunk by a billion times in area in the last 50 years. And magnetic disk drives still store today about 70% of all information. And what does this mean? This means that if you look inside the cloud, which is so important, you will see, of course, uh, computing systems, but largely it consists of massive numbers of magnetic disk drives to store all the information that we need. And this incredible ability to store all information, and basically an important milestone was in about 2007, when the capacity of all the disk drives made in one year could essentially store all information known to mankind at that time. Of course, now we're creating more, much more digital information. This ability to store digital information extremely cheaply and access it through modern communications has, of course, meant that in the last 15 years, uh, new companies have developed, like Facebook and Google, which basically are some of the most valuable corporations today, because that data is itself extremely important and from which we can extract knowledge. And if you look at the evolution of the world's storage capacity, you can see this here in a very nice article published in Science a few years ago, where these authors explored all the devices in orange or analog devices, and all the devices in blue are digital. And within a period of about 10 years, we move from this analog world to a digital world. We move from books to magnetic disk drives, which, of course, means, for example, you no longer need a library because you can access all the information in the world from your, uh, from your computer through the cloud. So I want to briefly discuss what made this possible uh, to a large extent. And so I want to talk about uh, spintronics. And so all of you will know that an electron, of course, has a charge. It has a spin, which is a quantum mechanical property. It just takes two values, spin uh, plus a half and minus a half. And we can create new materials in which we can create electron currents, which are spin polarized. All the spins are pointing up, or all the spins are pointing down. And we can manipulate those currents and detect them and build new types of devices. And the one that Yuri mentioned was a device that we invented to read this tiny magnetic bits in a magnetic disk drive using a new magnetoresistive phenomenon, uh, 
which is basically formed by taking a sandwich of two very thin magnetic layers separated by a very thin copper layer. And when you reorient the magnetic moments of these magnetic layers, you can change the resistance of this spin valve, we called it, device. And it turns out that we use the change in resistance of this device as it's flown over these magnetic bits. Then we'll change the resistance from the fringing field from these magnetic bits. And this enabled us to improve the capacity of a magnetic disk drive by 1,000 times within the space of just a few years after this technology was introduced in IBM disk drives in 1997. And since then, there's another factor of 10 or more improvement in the density because of the exquisite sensitivity of these magnetoresistive spin valve devices. I'm not going to tell you how they operate, uh, but I want to briefly mention another device which looks very similar, which is now used in magnetic disk drives. All the engineering is the same engineering we developed for the spin valve. This device then consists of this red and blue layers. These are magnetic layers. Magnetic moments are pointing perpendicular to these areas, and this gray area is a very, very thin insulating layer. The electrons now tunnel from one magnetic layer to the other. Because this magnetic surface is magnetized, then they have more electrons of one spin orientation than the other. And for some other technical reasons, the electrical current can be spin filtered through this insulating layer so that it's nearly 100% spin polarized. Only up spin electrons cross. And when the opposing layer is in the same magnetic orientation, these electrons can find empty electronic states into which they can tunnel. If it's magnetized in the opposite direction, you effectively, uh, there are no states into which these electrons can tunnel and the current can be turned off. So it's like a magnetic switch. And it's much more sensitive, or the change in conductance can be at room temperature factors of several hundred percent. And this is then a very interesting device. And using the same spin engineering techniques we used to develop the spin valve, we could effectively just replace a metallic copper layer separating these magnetic electrodes with an ultra-thin layer of an insulator. It turns out it has to be formed from magnesium oxide, which we also demonstrated. This device then acts like a fantastic sensor of tiny magnetic fields, because these fields will change the orientation of one of these magnetic layers in an analog fashion, actually. Now, on the other hand, we could use the same device as a memory element, as Yuri mentioned in his introduction. In this case, we design this device so this layer on the right-hand side either points to the right or it points to the left. And it does that in a non-volatile fashion. These are two stable states. And we can uh, detect the state by simply passing a tiny current. One state has a low resistance, one state has a high resistance. Originally, when we proposed this technology as a non-volatile memory element, we proposed using tiny magnetic fields to switch the direction of this magnetic moment. And we demonstrated that works. But today, a uh, more interesting technology is simply to pass big current through. The current is spin polarized, as I mentioned. An electron, which has a spin orientation, carries a quantum of spin angular momentum. And this angular momentum can act like a torque, just like a physical angular momentum, and can cause the magnetization to rotate. And this is how today we would switch the direction and change the memory state from a zero to one or backwards by simply passing a big enough current. And then you incorporate these tunnel junctions into a so-called cross-point array. These are metal lines pointing all in one direction. These are metal lines pointing in 90 degrees. And at every intersection point, you introduce a tunnel junction or memory element. And this is very con like a conventional solid-state memory. But it would be non-volatile. It would mem mem be mem memorize itself in the direction of magnetization. So it turns out I wanted to show you how long it can take from an idea. So we proposed this in 1995. Uh, this is a confidential foil. We were funded by the military, by the DARPA, to demonstrate whether or not this concept would work. And in 1998, we had demonstrated some important criteria, like we have demonstrated the resistance of this tunneling junction. We could reduce the resistance known at that time by uh, nine orders of magnitude to make it useful and we could develop sufficient tunneling magnetic resistance to make a useful device. But nevertheless, that was in 1998, and then uh, 1999, we actually demonstrated, fully integrated a 1,000-bit array, proving the concept that we could read these, these tunnel junctions in, in a couple of nanoseconds, and we could write with local magnetic fields. And then 
a few years later, uh, with my colleague Bill Gallagher at Yorktown Heights, we demonstrated a 16 megabit fully functional uh, memory uh, using magnetic tunnel junction memory elements. But nevertheless, it's still taken quite some time. And it was only uh, in the last three or four years that major companies have been interested in this technology because charge-based memory technologies have come to the end of their roadmap. And uh, I was just at Samsung yesterday, and they tell me that uh, mid-year this year, they will be introducing uh, this technology in a significant uh, way. So this will be 20 years or more, but it will be, I think, a second major success of Spintronics after the spin valve uh, recording sensor device. But this technology, just like charge-based technologies, is innately two-dimensional. We have a single array of transistors in silicon which we're going to use to access these tunnel junction memory elements. So we need to do something else. And I want to discuss something else, which is this device I proposed in 2002. Uh, it's what I call racetrack memory. And it involves just a very simple concept that here is a silicon wafer where we build circuits for reading and writing and interrogating magnetic domain walls that are moved in a magnetic nanowire. So this red thing is a very tall, thin nanowire made of a continuous magnetic material. And we can magnetize it so it points up or down. And the boundary between these red and blue regions is a domain wall. And these domain walls are where we store information, the presence uh, of a domain wall could be a one, the absence is a zero. But the trick is, by simply passing a current into this wire, we can move the information, all these domain walls, around the wire. And then we move the information to a single writing element to write it, or a single reading element to write it, incorporated into this racetrack. So the concept is, this is innately three-dimensional. So whereas in silicon you would store in a two-dimensional region a single bit of information, we can store 100 domain walls in the same area, and of course this could provide a very interesting uh, memory. When I proposed this, um, nobody had demonstrated the motion of this series of domain walls in this way. So we didn't really know how feasible this would be. But the concept would then, eventually we would build billions of these vertical nano wires. It's also possible to build horizontal racetracks and simply stack them vertically and use known techniques to access them. This seems to be a simpler concept. Well, how does it work? If you take a magnetic material shown in blue and you introduce current from a battery, you have equal numbers of upspin and downspin electrons. But in many magnetic systems which are magnetized in a particular direction, the electrons will be scattered differently when they're polarized up and when their spin is down. And this is a phenomenon that was known about in the 1930s and was proposed by Neville Mott. This phenomenon means that the current you introduce into a magnetic material is carried by electrons of one spin orientation. And this is a current of spin angular momentum. This means that if we have a domain wall, which is a region between a magnetic moment pointing to your right, and here a second domain magnetization pointing to your left, and on the nanoscale, the boundary between these regions has a particular size and is a well-defined object. It even has mass and it has momentum. Now you bring in conduction electrons by passing current. They're spin polarized because of the scattering. And then when this conduction electrons passes the domain wall, it will adiabatically follow the local magnetization and deliver a quantum of spin angular momentum to this wall, causing approximately one moment to rotate for every polarized electron that crosses the wall. So with a big enough current, we can move this domain wall. And what we demonstrated was, within a few years of starting this project, that we could move a series of domain walls at speeds of about 100 meters per second for reasonable current densities that don't heat up the wires too much. And what it meant was that all of the spin angular momentum from the conduction electrons, we could transfer to the magnetic domain walls. This was quite, I think, surprising. It's also possible to lose the spin angular momentum to the lattice through various techniques. So we first published these results in 10 years ago, in 2008. First demonstration concept, we could introduce in a horizontal racetrack, a magnetic nanowire. We could introduce domains. We could detect them. 
and we can move a series of domain walls backwards and forwards, proving the basic principle of racetrack memory. And so this was, uh, if you like, the first uh, edition of racetrack memory. Now, I don't have time to discuss much about the physics, but over the last 10 years, we've actually evolved this concept and by discovering entirely new physics that wasn't anticipated 10 years ago. And now in the previous foil, the electrons, the domain walls, would move in the direction of the flow of spin angular momentum created by this spin dependent scattering within the magnetic material. So a few years later, uh, we and others discovered that in some materials, the domain walls would move in the opposite direction, but much faster. And so there are new mechanisms at play. And the mechanism is derived from underneath the racetrack, we build this, this yellow wire, which is a metal with strong spin orbit coupling. When we pass a current into this metal, it's converted into a spin current flowing through the metal wire with a spin polarization perpendicular to the current direction. And the, you basically convert charge current through a different mechanism, it's called the spin hall effect, into a spin current. These spin polarized electrons can diffuse into neighboring magnetic layer, the racetrack, and can cause the domain walls to move because they apply a torque on these walls. So this is uh, what we, we, we were first to demonstrate this concept, and this is like this racetrack 3.0. And more recently, we've demonstrated uh, that we can create a racetrack where there's no net magnetization in any part of the racetrack, therefore eliminating these any dipole fields which would cause interaction between one domain wall and another domain wall. And it turns out at the same time, we discovered another new, new mechanism that drives these domain walls even more efficiently. So now we can move them at speeds exceeding one kilometer per second, 10 times faster speeds for the same current densities than we could 10 years ago, and com using completely different physics that was entirely unanticipated at that time. So again, this is an innately three-dimensional technology, which we believe with this new physics, we can create devices that can operate on time scales down to 100 picosecond. And uh, this type of technology would be a million times faster than a magnetic disk drive, would be much more compact and dense and use 50 times less energy, and it would be, of course, totally non-volatile. So we think it's a very, very interesting technology. So you might ask, how do we look at the physics? So currently, we're mostly looking at these horizontal racetracks. You can see in the top, this is a, uh, we use optical techniques it's called Kerr microscopy, where we reflect a polarized light beam from the surface and the polarization plane is slightly rotated depending upon the magnetization direction. And then we could use this to detect these domain walls. And these racetracks, you can see on the right-hand side, they consist of this structure. You have this orange layer, which is a a heavy metal like platinum could also be tungsten. And the actual magnetic racetrack consists of these three layers, a green layer, which is cobalt. And it's uh, approximately 1.5 to 3 angstroms thick. And the middle layer, blue, is nickel. This is approximately 7 angstroms thick. So the whole racetrack is 1 nanometer thick. And this uh, platinum layer is maybe 2 or 3 nanometers thick. In this racetrack, we can move these domain walls at speeds of 300 meters per second. And underneath, this is a racetrack, which I just briefly discussed. We call it a synthetic antiferromagnet, which is a concept that I first introduced for spin valves and has been used in all magnetic recording read sensors since that time. And it basically, we make, here is a lower racetrack. We make an exact duplicate copy of the racetrack where every single magnetic moment is reversed in direction. And we do that by separating these two racetracks with an atomically thin layer of ruthenium, which gives rise to an antiferromagnetic coupling. So the magnetic domains you see here will be reversed in the upper layer. And the domain wall, similarly, would be reversed. So now we can de devise a racetrack where there's no net magnetization in the whole racetrack. This is very important. But let me just briefly uh, discuss one or two of the uh, sci scientific uh, phenomenon that are needed. And one of them is something called a uh, dilizhinsky mariev exchange interaction. That's a rather technical thing. But the idea is if you have systems with broken symmetry, such as this racetrack with a platinum layer underneath, it turns out at the interface between platinum and the neighboring cobalt layer, the magnetic moments no longer want to be ferromagnetically aligned in the cobalt. 
they actually become aligned in a chiral fashion. They want to be aligned perpendicular to each other, but in a chiral fashion. So that means that they will always be either always clockwise with platinum, they'll always be anti-clockwise oriented with, let's say, tungsten. It's a very interesting uh, interaction that was known about in the 1960s and leads to rather complex non-collinear non structures. So this domain wall, in the racetrack, we have a region pointing up and a region pointing down, and then the magnetization rotates from an up to a down direction by rotating clockwise in a plane perpendicular to the wall. This is called a nail domain wall, which is stabilized by the same dielizinski maria interaction. The next domain wall, you see the moment rotates from a down direction to an up direction, will also be clockwise. So the moment here in the middle of the domain wall will be pointing in the opposite direction to the first one. This turns out to be critically important in moving all the domain walls in the same direction. And, uh, well, that's what I wanted to say. So, and then finally, a spin hole effect I mentioned. This is a very interesting phenomenon. Maybe many of you are familiar with the conventional hall effect, where you pass current into a material in the presence of a large perpendicular magnetic field. The electrons feel a Lorentz force and are rotated to the left or to the right. And this gives rise to a voltage across a metal layer. And it turns out you can do the same thing in, for creating a pure spin current in the absence of any magnetic field and any magnetization in materials with strong spin orbit coupling where the, the spin is connected to the lattice and you introduce a current and then let's say this is platinum, then you will generate a spin current. You can convert a charged current into a pure spin current and the spin current is chiral. It will rotate around this circumference of this metal wire and you can see here the polarization is perpendicular to the current direction but the spins will then flow into neighboring layers like a magnetic layer and deliver very large spin currents. And this phenomenon of the spin hole effect was predicted many years ago, but it's only in recent years that it's been found to be quite large in metals. Let's say we take platinum. Every time an electron passes through the platinum will create approximately one third of a spin of an electron. So we have more current, we create more spin uh, spin polarized electrons. And it turns out you can see this effect not only in simple metals like platinum and tungsten, tungsten oxide, you can also see it in more interesting systems. And so I mentioned briefly the dielizinski maria interaction gives rise to complex magnetic structures. And it turns out you can also see complex magnetic structures in systems with frustration. And so for it turns out, for example, even in a cubic system, this is a system of iridium and manganese, a simple FCC structure. The, here, the, the pink atoms are the manganese atoms. And you can see in this 111 plane, the manganese moments, they're magnetized. They want to be aligned in the plane, and the manganese atoms want their moments to be anti-parallel. But on this triangular lattice in the 111 plane, they're frustrated. And so instead, they orient themselves at 120 degrees to each other, but again, in a chiral fashion. And this chirality of this structure gives rise again to something called a berry phase, a berry field. And this leads to an extremely, we, we first found, a large spin hole effect. So it's been very exciting that in the last few years, this, this idea of converting charge current to pure spin currents using in materials with strong spin orbit coupling or in other systems with these large berry fields or curvatures has meant uh, this spin hole effect has increased uh, our record breaking 50% in a conventional metal of tungsten with a bit of oxygen. And I, perhaps some of you have heard of topological insulators. I learned a lot about this today. But in these topological insulators, it's also been uh, proposed or experimentally uh, purported to see very large spin hole effects of more than 100 in some materials. This, if it's true, will be extremely interesting. Briefly, go back to this concept. If you have domain walls, they will actually have, just like any magnet, you have stray fields. And these stray fields, the dipole fields, will cause interaction between domain walls. So as I mentioned, to eliminate those, we have to build slightly more exotic structures, these synthetic antiferromagnets. I mentioned here, we build two normally identical racetracks, one nanometer thick layers on top of each other, coupled through an ultra-thin ruthenium layer, which causes the moments to be, form a mirror image of each other. So there's no magnetization anywhere, and we discovered once we, the more perfect is the balancing of these 
make the decisions going towards zero, we found that the velocity of the domain walls moved under current would increase by a factor of five, achieving speeds of one kilometer per second for the first time at room temperature, making it very exciting. So racetrack looks like a very interesting technology. And again, because of the uh, problems of evolving conventional charge-based technologies, tremendous interest today by several uh, major companies. Now, it turns out, if I have time, I want to briefly discuss two more topics. One is I want to briefly discuss a topic uh, of skirmions. Now, I don't know if many of you are familiar with skirmions. No, nobody. <laughs> well, skirmion is a really interesting object. If you take a magnetic film and it's all magnetized in the up direction, sometimes it was predicted and then experimentally observed about 10 years ago that the system will break up into a array of skirmions, which are circular regions where the magnetization in the middle is in the opposite direction, is circular, and the wall itself is a chiral domain wall, similar to the domain walls I discussed earlier. And there are two types of skirmions. There are block and nail skirmions. On the one case, on the nail skirmion, magnetization from the outside to the inside rotates in a direction uh, along the radius. And because it's chiral, then all the moments will be rotating from the outside to the inside, all the way around the wall. This is fixed by this chiral Dilizinski rear exchange interaction. Now, in the case of a block skirmion, instead of rotating along the radius, these moments rotate along the, uh, along the circumference. So around the circumference, you see a magnetic moment always in the same chiral direction. Now, there's an even more interesting object that was theoretically predicted. It's called an antiskirmion. In the case of the antiskirmion, as you go around this wall, the wall changes from a nail wall to a block wall, to another nail wall, block nail around, each time switching the chirality. This hadn't been observed till we observed it about a year ago. We published it in Nature, and we detected it using something called Lorentz transmission electron microscopy. So to do this, we simply take an electron beam, uh, we pass it through a very thin slide. It has to be less than approximately uh, 200 nanometers thick. And then when the electrons pass through, if, uh, if there's any in-plane magnetization, they will feel a Lorentz force, and they'll move to the left or to the right. And so we can calculate what we should expect to see in this microscope. This is what we did. So we can simulate using micromagnetic simulations, all of these structures, and then we can calculate what we should see in the microscope. So if you look at the nail skirmion, what we should see is, is nothing, because the electron beam is deflected around the circumference. You don't see anything. And in the case of a block skirmion, you basically see a blob of intense electrons in the middle. Uh, but for an anti-skirmion, you see this more complicated structure like a clover leaf. Here you see the regions of intense uh, electron, int increased electron intensity, and here, you can't see it, uh, regions of decreased electron intensity. So we can easily distinguish this antiskirmion from skirmions. And now, uh, without going into any detail, it turns out we look at this material, a Heusler compound. I'm not going to discuss it in detail. It's a simple, uh, simple structure, you know, which is, uh, by the magnetic nature, is, it's a tetragonal structure, and the magnetization evolves like this, well, I think I'm going to skip this. It doesn't matter. It's a material which has a particular symmetry, which is predicted to support antiskirmions. And this is what we found in our Lorentz microscope. If you look at the top left, you can see here, this is the, a real image from a single antiskirmion. And these antiskirmions, as I mentioned, are formed in arrays. This is an array of antiskirmions, and we can, it evolves as a function of temperature and as a function of perpendicular field. If the field is too big, then these antiskirmions disappear. And so this is, uh, this is the, the first observation. So it was a very nice observation we made in my institute. And uh, we can plot out, for example, the phase diagram. This is the perpendicular field, and this is temperature from the ordering temperature of this magnetic material to the lowest temperature we can look in our microscope. And we saw these antiskirmions exist over a very wide range of field and temperature as compared to skirmions. And they also have a lot of very interesting other properties, which I really don't have time to discuss. So, for example, we're looking at how can we 
see, can current move these antiskyomions? So we can build structures by using a technique called Fokestein milling. We can mill a very, very thin layer. This is shown here. This is 8 microns by 8 microns. We can attach electrodes, and we can apply current pulses in the microscope to see the motion of the antiskyomions. And if you're looking very, very carefully, you should be able to see the, the, these antiskyomions moving in the images to the right and to the left a little bit. Can anybody see the move? Probably not. Oh, yeah, there we are. Now we can see. Can you see anything move? Maybe not? Uh, now, yeah, you should be able to see a little bit of motion of these antiskyomions under current pulses. Can you see? Anyway, it turns out it's not interesting. It turns out it's due to temperature. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still working on this. We haven't yet seen move, and now we don't believe they will move with current. But one thing we did discover, which is super interesting, here we make a needle. This needle is make, made by uh, an argon ion a gallium, beam of gallium ions, which we can use to remove material. We can make this long needle, it's eight microns long, and we can vary the thickness from thin to thick. And what we discovered was, in these systems, that the uh, nature of this anti skirmion phase has a very strong dependence on the thickness of the material through which we are imaging, unlike skirmions. And so we got some very nice, beautiful data. This is actually magnetic force microscopy, not Lorentz TM. So here we can directly measure the out-of-plane component of the magnetization. This is showing you here as a function of the, the thickness of this material. So from 800 nanometers to 2 microns, can you see this, this oscillation, magnetization pointing up to down, up to down? You can see that it changes as a function of increasing thickness, and it gets longer. And here you can see visually, this is the same image. This is a a, a wedge, we're varying here, the thickness is shown here, 0.6 microns to 4 microns, and this is the, just across this wedge, this is thin and this is thick, and I think you can clearly see that the separation between plus minus magnetization plus minus is increasing along the thickness. You can see that, right? And we can change that this is because the antiskermion uh, structure is evolved from a helical structure where the magnetization rotates from an up to a down direction with a certain period. And then as you change the temperature field, it will revert to an array of antiskermions at maximum field, go to a uniform state. And we can create these helical arrangements of, skirmi of this, uh, this system by applying appropriate fields. So this is the helix. Here it's rotating in this direction. Here it's rotating in a perpendicular direction. And in this system, by symmetry, it can only point, rotate along certain directions in the crystal lattice. And so now, if we change the field, these are actually antiskermions, not detected with the Lorentz microscopy, directly imaged using magnetic force microscopy. And again, you can see, as we go from a thin region to a thicker region, the size of the antiskermions is increasing. Remarkably, they increase from 100 nanometers when the thickness of the device is 40 nanometers up to uh, several microns when we make them micron thick. We understand this. This, fact, this is in fact, is due to long-range dipole fields. So these, why am I saying this? It turns out this is a very interesting magnetic object that we could use to, let's say, instead of a domain wall in a racetrack memory, potentially. It looks much more interesting than scumions. So in the last few moments, I want to briefly revert to this topic, which is, OK, it talks about spintronics. And we've already demonstrated we could use spintronics to make the world's most sensitive detectors of magnetic field at room temperature. We've demonstrated we could build a fantastic new type of non-volatile magnetic memory, which is MREM coming onto the market. And racetrack memory, I think, is a, will be the future main uh, outcome of spintronics. It looks fantastic. And I want to briefly talk about this question, which many of you might be familiar with, which is uh, talking about computing systems. We, of course, have our own computing system, and it has some, um, uh, not really advantages, some differences from silicon. In particular, it innately integrates memory and computing. Uh, it's a parallel distributed system. It's event-driven. It has very low active power. And of course, it's, uh, it has a learning system. Many of us, we could learn things. We're reconfigurable. Whereas uh, silicon-based systems tend to, and this is the problem, they have huge passive power. When they're not doing anything, they're using a lot of power exceeding the amount of power when we, the amount of power contributing to real computing. And of course, it's hardwired. So many different ideas. And so it's um, been very interesting in the last few years. The concept is, can we somehow or other 
uh, use, be inspired by the brain to build new devices that could be more energy efficient. So the concept is this brain, our brain, can make a computation about a million times less, using a million times less energy than today's advanced silicon-based systems. And so uh, another difference, let's uh, say, is that this brain is very three-dimensional and all the neurons are connected by wires, if you like, the synaptic connections, and there are many of them per neuron, maybe 10,000 or more per neuron. So a few years ago, um, DARPA had a program to imagine ways of building not the neurons, but the synapt synapses, which I was involved with at IBM. And I proposed we could use our magnetic tunneling junction to build a synapse. So one of the properties of the synapse in the biological world is that its synapse connects neurons, and when these neurons, which are integrating elements, when they fire their pulses, when the two neurons at either end of the synapse fire in a way that is coherent, that say one fires within 100 milliseconds of the uh, neuron at the, other, uh, at the other end of the synapse, the synaptic connection will strengthen. Whereas if this one fires uh, after this one, it will weaken. This is called spike timing dependent plasticity. It is thought to be important in the biological brain. So we imagined, okay, let's try to see whether we could build something that would mimic this property of a synapse. And this is what we came up with. Uh, fortunately, we never published the results, but we basically used this tunneling junction, which is almost a perfect synapse. Because if you, it has resistance. If you pass current, enough current, you will rotate the moments. That will change the current. And we demonstrated that if we use an array of 100 tunneling junctions, you can see this is what the conductance of 100 tunnel junctions look like as a function of the time delay between voltage pulses of a special type that we injected into the tunnel junction. So we could weaken and strengthen the conductance by simply the timing of voltage pulses, similar to the biological world. In fact, you can see it looks similar. And over the last, uh, this is work we did maybe eight years ago, there have been many, many concepts to build different types of synaptic connections which are charge-based, spin-based, or ion-based. However, it's not clear to me that any of these are actually very useful in terms of building really low-power computing devices. It's extremely difficult, for example, to use charge to make any low-power device. So most interestingly is this concept of using ions. I briefly mentioned that, and this is what we want to do. We want to use ionic currents to manipulate insulating materials and term them metallic. You could do this by applying electric fields. And there are two important regimes. Uh, let's say we take a material like vanadium dioxide. It's a very well-known system, which at room temperature is an insulator. You heat it to 60 degrees, it becomes a metal. Changes its conductance tremendously. And so we can do this on the picosecond timescale. We can take insulating VO2, and we demonstrate it in a collaboration with Hermann Durer and a number of others, using picosecond pulses of current, we can switch it, electric field, we can switch it to a metal. And within, within 100 picoseconds, there will be a structural transformation. It's not due to heat. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about, on the other hand, we can convert insulators to metals on much slower time scales using concepts which are a little bit different, using um, currents of ions. This is something that we discovered. This is the idea. On the left side, you see a conventional transistor. The green is a channel. We have a source, a drain. The yellow is an insulator, a gate dielectric. We apply electric field, a voltage, across the gate dielectric, and electrostatically, we introduce charge into the channel. And uh, you can, in principle, uh, obtain charge carry densities of this order of magnitude, 10 to the 13 per square centimeter. Now, there's another approach used particularly in organic chemistry, which is instead of a gate, a hard, like an oxide gate dielectric, we replace it with an ionic liquid, shown here in this cartoon. You have large organic molecules, half are positively charged, a different organic molecule is negatively charged, but they have reasonable ionic mobilities. We apply an electric field across this liquid, and this will cause uh, a plane of, say, positively charged molecules to be formed, let's say, on the surface of an oxide. Then, in this so-called EDL, the electric double layer, you, in principle, could electrostatically induce charge carrier densities 100 times higher than in a conventional transistor. However, what we showed was this doesn't really work in many cases, and rather you uh, generate, uh, you can actually cause remarkable changes in properties of material. So this is, if you look at this curve 
in purple, this is how the resistance of a material, vanadium dioxide, changes as a function of temperature. So it's a metal at room temperature or just above room temperature. You reduce the temperature, you can see a transition. The resistance dramatically increases by four orders of magnitude and much more as you reduce the temperature. It becomes an insulator. What we showed was by this ionic liquid gating process, remarkably, this transition is suppressed. You apply two volts across this liquid, and now you can see that as you cool down in red, the resistance, inc the resistance will increase in the metallic state, but nevertheless, it remains conducting all the way to low temperatures. And on the right-hand side, uh, you can see these are two different films of vanadium dioxide grown in different ways. But nevertheless, we can completely suppress this metal insulator transition. Here, this material on the right-hand side, it's insulating at room temperature. After this liquid gating, it becomes a metal. So why is that? And we showed that this is due to the liquid uh, creates such large electric fields that we start to remove oxygen. And in this case, we demonstrated that just a, that about 0.3 atomic percent of oxygen leaves and goes into the liquid. I must admit, even though our paper now in science is cited uh, more than 500 times, a lot of people didn't believe us. And so recently, in my institute in Halle, we've visualized, seen this process at work, not in vanadium dioxide, but in another system which is more interesting, it's called strontium cobalt O3, it's a cubic perovskite. It consists of uh, this structure. Uh, and then there's a related cousin, it's called a brown millerite, where you remove half a mole of oxygen, you form this vacancy ordered structure, where here the oxygens are removed every other layer, and this is no longer a metallic ferromagnet, this is actually an insulating antiferromagnet. And what we demonstrated was we can see this whole process take place in the transmission electron microscope where we introduce this ionic liquid and we gate this device and we can turn it, the perovskite, into the brown millerite and backwards and forwards. And I just want to show you then this is what it looks like. We basically create a cross-section of this oxide material. We apply in the microscope ionic liquid, uh, apply gate voltage, and then you can see what was, this is the brown millerite, you can see, I think, this alternating structure. And then you can see this alternating structure disappears from the top as it turns into the perovskite as we introduce oxygen into this brown millerite. It takes several minutes, but you can see this uh, perovskite brown millerite phase, eventually it's all turned into the brown millerite. We can also follow that using the structural analysis is the Fourier transform of, the, of these patterns, and we can see the unit cell, which was doubled, becomes uh, halved as we create this process. And by simply reversing this, uh, this, this um, gate voltage, we can make it go backwards. So here, a negative gate voltage is injecting oxygen ions, half a mole per strontium cobalt O2.5. And now we can do the reverse operation, change the sign, and you can see what was this perovskite turns from the top into the brown millerite, and we conventionally completely revert it. So we can turn a metallic ferromagnet into an insulating antiferromagnet backwards and forwards. I think this is super interesting. Proving oxygen ion migration plays this very significant role. And we can do this, and we can do this in many systems. But more interesting, what we're doing currently is that we can now create a resist pattern on the surface of the oxide channel, let's say with holes, and the ionic liquid will only gate through those holes. Wherever there's a resistance, nothing happens. So uh, if we, this is, this is a conducting atomic uh, microscope image of this. This shows it blue is conducting. If we don't have any resist, it no, no longer changes its state. So wh what is this? Why am I interested in this? Because we can make now complex three-dimensional mesostructures. We take a uniform film of this oxide. We put a resist with some holes. We gate through these holes, and wherever we have gating, we can create a column of conducting material in the vanadium dioxide shown here. And it turns out it's very effective. We've now demonstrated this is one micron size holes. We've now demonstrated we can do the same thing on size scales of 10 nanometers. And so actually by patterning complex patterns into the resist, we can make columns on the scale of 10 nanometers of conducting material without the need to lithographically remove any element. We believe this is very important, and we could we're using this now to make all sorts of different types of three-dimensional mesostructures just from a surface. We can do this also with other oxides like lanthanum manganite and the same strontium cobalt oxide. 
although in those cases it's, it's uh, even more interesting. So um, I think this idea of complex mesostructures created from surfaces, flat surfaces or curved surfaces, is really interesting. And of course, it's a long way from neuromorphic or cognitive computing, but I think it is uh, on the way to creating very interesting potential devices for that purpose. So I think uh, I'm running out of time, so I want to summarize by saying I think that uh, this concept of moving from today's innately two-dimensional technologies to innately three-dimensional technologies is a very interesting one. I think the racetrack memory I discussed uh, promises uh, 100 times the storage capacity of any conventional memory. memory. It could certainly replace, replace flash and vertical NAND flash and magnetic disk drives, we'd have the same capacity as a magnetic disk drive in a tiny chip, which would consume much less energy and be a million times faster. And I think racetrack memory, we've proven or developed or discovered in the last uh, just three to five years all the essential physics that makes this possible. And I think this is very, very exciting. And I think on the other hand, cognitive devices may be mimicking some aspects of the brain. It's a long way uh, from doing anything, but the, the goal is to imagine ways of creating devices may be connected reservoirs of, in the way that I've discussed. Uh, and I think uh, this concept of ion electronics and modifying the properties of materials in very dramatic ways promises the ability to create really interesting, complex, three-dimensional mesostructures. We've demonstrated this using metal and insulators. We've also demonstrated it using uh, antiferromagnets and ferromagnets on the 10 nanometer size scale without the need for any removal of a material. I think this is, and it's a dynamic, reversible process. So I think I'm going to end at that point. Thank you very much. No questions here. Great talk, Stuart. Um, for the racetrack memory, uh, what kind of latency are you predicting for accessing uh, reading and writing into uh, yeah, okay. one of these? This is a very interesting question. And latency basically means, okay, if we've got 100 domain walls, we'd have to move 100 domain walls. We can move them easily at speeds of a kilometer per second. It's a micron long, so the latency is quite short. However, the most interesting aspect of racetrack is that in the same technology, you can trade off latency versus density. So you could have all identical billions of racetracks and you could decide, okay, this set of racetracks, I'm only going to store one domain wall, there's no latency, or you could store 100 domain walls, there is latency, but greater density. So you can dynamically trade off density with latency as you, and I think this is uh, totally impossible with any other technology, but you don't need to do anything, you get it for free. And I think this means that the computer architectures you need, you have to evolve them to take advantage of these unique properties. Yeah. Is there any trouble with, oh, this is strange. Is there any what? Is there any trouble with the domains sort of blurring together uh, Okay, the well, walls? that's a super, super interesting question. So to date, we can see that the domain walls appear. We can move them backwards and forwards almost indefinitely. They don't interfere. However, as I mentioned, we're using optical processes to detect them, and the wires then are quite wide, and we cannot detect them if the domain walls are too close. So the next step is to build all electrical racetrack where we can detect and uh, put in the domain walls, and that's currently what we're working on. Then we can exactly uh, answer your question. Um, so great work on the anti skirmion It's really great to see a proof of concept. Um, so I see that the anti skirmion size, they're about 100 nanometers. So um, is there any kind of work to try to scale down that size, because you want to make very small miniaturization of devices? So it turns out, well, this is an interesting question. Let's say if you build three-dimensional racetrack, then you don't have to make them super small. And it turns out, like, this is exactly the, uh, the, the concept that Samsung has. You know, they have a fantastic concept for building uh, vertical uh, structures with, uh, for flash memory cells. They build currently 64 layers of flash memory cells using very interesting techniques to access them. And they did that whilst making the cells bigger than they would otherwise be, because otherwise you don't have enough electrons and you cannot store uh, reliably information. 
So we could do the same thing in racetrack. We don't need to make them super small because we got the third dimension, if you like. So this is the advantage. However, uh, a slightly different answer would be that the, you know, it's not so easy to detect these skimmions. And the Lorentz microscopy technique, while it's fantastic, is actually a technique where you're no longer in focus and there's no um, contrast. So therefore, our resolution is approximately 15 nanometers or something. And so, but of course, there are other techniques you could use. And again, just like in answer to this question, we really want to build um, integrated devices where we know we have antiskermions and we can read and write them in an integrated way. Then we can look at smaller ones. That's the goal. Uh, do the synapses that you build uh, respond to the uh, amplitude of the pulses or the interpulse intervals? It basically, it, but in the, in the, it's the inter, you basically, the way we did it is you have two voltage pulses and there's some threshold voltage above which you cannot change the, the magnetic moments in the tunnel junction. And so you basically make it so that when they add up together, then in a, in a, in a coherent fashion, they will provide enough, uh, you, you'll exceed that threshold and they will switch. This is basically how it works. So it's really the, the, the magnitude of the two pulses connected together. And they're specially shaped so that uh, the, as you uh, change the separation, then you will, the overlap period changes, and therefore you get a different response. There are many ways of doing it, but it's not actually that useful because it takes charge current, and the charge current is so large, you, you take a lot of energy. So it's very beautiful uh, that it works so well, but again, the problem is these charge currents, just through joule heating, you just get too much energy consumed. I have a question, but it's more of a philosophical kind. Uh, mm -hmm. You discussed kind of yep. many technologies on yep. different stage of maturity. Mm -hmm. Some of them already in the product, some of them yep. are extremely advanced. Yeah. But what mm. struck me is that this 20 years of... Yeah, yeah, it takes a long time. Yeah. 20, 30 years of yeah. something that finally will hit the market and yep. uh, change our lives. It will be dramatic yeah. changes, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. but. Mm -hmm. What defines this 20 years or 30? What, what this delay is, you know, we're yeah. not waiting for, for yeah. 20 years. It's a huge yeah. amount of work, and I know from yeah. inside mm -hmm. that is uh, built into. But mm -hmm. with respect to these technologies, mm. what are the major problems to, mm. you know, make it to Let's final? see, uh, there are many answers to that. One, let's say we take MRAM. Then one of the reasons why it's finally coming into production is that you needed a company like Samsung and the tool suppliers to build the tools required to deposit these magnetic layers. So I mentioned you have a tunnel junction, it's one nanometer thick. It has to be uniform over 300 millimeter wafers. When we first proposed this technology in 1995, everybody said it's impossible. And all the major competitors decided to go with metal spin valve structures, which we said will never work. They don't have enough resistance, so we're totally right. And, but it turns out today, even though uh, the resistance depends exponentially on the thickness of the tunnel barrier. You can make over 300 millimeter wafer a layer of magnesium oxide, which will mean there's no, that the, just the uh, change in resistance will be a 1% or something. It's amazing. So tools are super important. So that may be five years because of a specialized tool. Then uh, let's say in MRAM, you've got to etch the material. So it's extremely difficult to etch uh, tunnel junction devices, which are at maximum minimum size spacing, almost impossible. You need to develop new iron, iron milling techniques, and then you need techniques to measure all these things. So this is one part. But the, I think it's much more interesting than that. Let's say, uh, let's say take racetrack. If there were more people working on racetrack, more money, could we have even gone as far as we have today, faster? And I think you could have accelerated a little bit. But in the end, you still need to have some, some understanding. You have to develop an understanding of the science, and then you need new concepts and new ideas. So, of course, if you could have more ideas more quickly, then maybe you could do it more quickly. But it's really, uh, you know, like this, this synthetic antiferminetic racetrack, which is so fantastic. Uh, nobody would have predicted it would have made any difference to the speed. They might have said the opposite, most likely, all our competitors would have done. But we, we only, then by making it, I was convinced it would work, but nevertheless, we were quite surprised that the domain walls would move five times faster for the same current density because this exchange field turns out to provide a torque which is much larger than the single layer where the torque is provided by the Dilichinsky-Maria exchange field. 
the coupling field for the ruthenium, which I discovered 25 years ago, is much bigger. And this is why they go faster. This is quite a surprise. It's very interesting. Of course, more money will be better. And philosophically, I do feel that because of 40 years of CMOS technology, where everyone knew how to evolve it, and uh, the, the trillions of dollars in their business and the hundreds of billions invested, it was very difficult for any other technology to find any traction. And even if you had a technology which was better, then nevertheless, the, the silicon-based technologies could, with more money and more investment, beat you to the marketplace. And then most companies like Samsung, Intel, they're very risk averse in terms of new, I would say, in terms of new technologies, unless they need to go to them. So this is why today, like Racetrack, even if we had Racetrack five years ago, maybe nobody would be interested. But today, I think like Samsung, Western Digital, Intel, Huawei, they're all interested in what we're doing and want to work with us because uh, they cannot evolve conventional charge-based memory elements any further. It's the end of the roadmap, it seems. Even with all that investment, they cannot do it. And like Global Foundries just announced last year, they are giving up on the seven nanometer technology nodes, not investing. Well, that's like they, don't, they really don't know how to go further. So it's interesting. So this is fantastic opportunity uh, for new technologies to finally emerge. And they need to take a lot of risks. So most of these uh, memory companies, their whole business is at risk. Just in the same way, when we introduced the spin valve uh, sensor technology, within three years, you went from 30 disk drive companies to essentially three. None of the, any, technology, any company who didn't have that technology would be out of business. And they can never catch up very difficult to catch up with the competitors. So this is really interesting. So technologies now will make an absolutely huge difference to companies that will win and lose. Of course, you know, companies like Samsung, Intel, they have tremendous resources. So I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's a very interesting one. Any other questions? Yeah.